Hi, everybody. This is Jano. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I met her at a talk over at Tufts. And she said she was interested in, in our conference. And then I didn't, I hadn't heard of her. And, and I have to say, there are incredible people that we just discover every day. I mean, this is what blessed unrest is about, right? There are these amazing people working all over the place we haven't heard of, and yet they're doing things that just uh, leave me in awe. And Jano is one of those people. And I, I really can't talk to all the things that she's done. Um, and that's what she's gonna do. And obviously she'll do a much better job than I would. But I just wanted to, to give you that little piece of background. So Jano, <laughs> Thank with you. A, a fanfare, you are on. <laughs> Thank you for your um, generous, um, kind introduction. Um, I don't want to talk a lot about, you know, what I do or why I do it. I'd like to, I'd like to look at this more as a conversation with you. And I love storytelling. So when Adam asked me uh, what I'm really passionate about, um, people often ask me because I've worked in so many countries around the world, you know, what's your favorite place? And, and every time I think to try to answer that question, the answer is always wherever I am right now. Um, yeah, no, just just to move move where you are right now a little bit. Can you pull your laptop um, or your video camera down so there's more space underneath your chin? Is this better for you? A little more. How's that? That's much better. Yeah, great. Okay, great. Because <laughs> we put captions on the bottom of the screen sometimes. Okay. Well, I'm going to invite everybody to be very active um, in the chat. Occasionally, I'm going to ask you a question and ask you to just type your answers into the chat so that we build our own collective intelligence. We can all see what everybody is thinking at this time. And I'm also going to share my screen with you. Um, I'll try to come back um, so we talk live. But uh, am I able to share my screen? What? I do share screen. I can't. I'm a fan. I'm an audience. Yeah, just fuck. Why is this so fucking hard? But, uh, are you seeing my screen, I hope? Okay, great. Here we go. So what I would like to talk about is my work in Haiti. Um, I work all over the Caribbean. That's my region of focus currently. Um, I'm a member of a global team, uh, part of the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. We support national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world, coming to grips with the impacts of climate change and how this affects the most vulnerable. Um, we work with many partners in the humanitarian sector. I am also currently part of the World Bank um, Cruise Caribbean team. CRUISE stands for Climate Risk Early Warning Systems, and we're working with Caribbean institutions um, that have to do with disaster management, um, water and natural resource management, um, hydrometeorological forecasting, um, and in this larger sort of context of climate resilient development on strategies to enable the region to um, not just survive, but thrive in a changing climate. So I want to talk with you about Haiti um, as the once and future green pearl of the Caribbean. And I'd like to start by asking you if you could use the chat to tell me what you think of, what do you, what do you imagine when you think of Haiti? I'm showing you a satellite picture of the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, um, which has become kind of an iconic view of Haiti. And let me see if I can, uh, where's the chat? Sorry, I'm trying to find the chat on my screen. Can I see it? 
There see. we go. All right. Okay. I see Tire Gardens, great mountain areas. Uh, what else do you think of when you think of Haiti? Does earthquake come to mind? Does poverty come to mind? Deforestation come to mind? Civil unrest? Uh, I don't know how many of you may be aware of the current situation in Haiti. It's a country um, which is not only um, unusually exposed to natural hazards, it's right smack in the middle of the hurricane track. If you throw all those spaghetti lines of hurricane tracks um, over the last any number of decades you want to choose, you'll find the island of Hispaniola, which is Dominican Republic on one side, Haiti on the other side, smack in the middle of that hurricane track. When, uh, when Haiti was uh, experiencing the, um, the earthquake, many of you may have heard about the tragic impact of improper sewage disposal by UN peacekeepers Nature is one of the most efficient dispersal mechanisms. That sewage containing um, the cholera um, uh, imported by foreign peacekeepers, which previously did not exist in Haiti, was disseminated through the largest river basin in the country um, and hit the population like a second earthquake. I want to show you this artist's painting. It's clearly a recent painting um, because it depicts a, a river um, flowing into a plain which uh, is rich with diverse agricultural cultivation. And this, uh, why, do I, why do I want to show you this painting um, in contrast to the satellite view of Haiti? This represents, in a way, the spiritual reality that Haitians feel. Art is a universal language. It's the language of, we could say, of the human soul. And in order to leverage the, to, to unleash the power of humanity, to transform as degraded an environment as Haiti experiences today, we need to have the ability to envision um, and to bring the passion of that vision forward. We also need to understand um, where we're coming from and where we're going. So how did Haiti get so dramatically um, degraded in terms of its, its ecosystems, its vegetative cover compared to the Dominican Republic? Well, I, uh, have to confess that as an undergraduate, I double majored in biology and political science. It was before the environment was invented as a field. Um, but I thought of myself as um, interested in that intersection and the need for us to develop both in developing countries and developed countries in a way that would restore the productivity of what we now call the environment. And if we go back through Haiti's history, I was not aware until this year, uh, well, let me say 2019, of the actual roots of deforestation in Haiti, which go back to Haiti's independence. And it's important to understand this. Haiti was the first independent Black nation in the world. And it was not granted that independence. It fought for independence, as many countries did throughout the colonial era, which lasted pretty much up until the 1960s. Some Caribbean countries today only have had independence since the late 1970s. But Haiti goes back to the end of the 19th century. At that time, uh, casting off the what was the French colonial yoke um, exploited a lot of the resources of the country in terms of economic resources. It was a very poor country struggling to survive. 
But Haiti has always been an important country geopolitically. That's why they had to fight. The founding fathers of the United States knew the geopolitical importance of Haiti. We can find documentation that refers to that, that corroborates how important this country was, even at that, the founding of our country. But France threatened Haiti shortly after independence with trying to take Haiti back again. And they demanded as a concession not to invade again, reparations for the French plantation owners. So that reveals to us um, two roots of deforestation. One was plantation agriculture, which devastated the entire Caribbean. Wholesale ecosystems were converted largely to sugarcane production uh, for rum, the triangle trade, and slavery was the oil of those times. It was the, the fuel source at the root of the economy. So Haiti was casting off not only um, the shackles of colonization, it was up against a already radically transformed environment. And then when demand for reparations was made, as a country, Haiti was too poor. They couldn't pay what was demanded. So they agreed to pay in timber. And that's where the dramatic cutting of timber has its roots. I tell this story because I confess my own ignorance and it was surprising to me. My assumption was looking at recent times that it had to do with negligent, uninformed land management practice using charcoal, which to this day is the primary source of household energy for over 60% of the Haitian population. Um, this truck that you see in this picture, on the bottom are bags of some sort of agricultural produce. It could even be, you know, coconuts or uh, citrus fruits, large lemons or grapefruits, but the top of the truck, those bags are charcoal. Charcoal is still at the root of the rural economy. So this is where we are in terms of a baseline. You can see the landscape in front of you, but where are we going? Haiti is developing, and I say Haiti because there are so many levels of society and different agencies, actors, organizations involved in crafting one of the boldest visions for climate resilient development with restorative ecosystem management at the root. This is the story that we don't often hear. So I wanna talk about climate change because climate change um, in the military terminology is a threat accelerator. And in Haiti, it is fundamentally a threat accelerator. Haiti is already experiencing impacts on agriculture and fishing, which are at the root of the rural economy. In terms of agriculture, I also wanna take this back and forth view of history and how important understanding history is to where we are today. So when Haiti experienced the earthquake in 2010, um, many countries came to assist. There were enormous investments, and there was also an enormous amount of food aid, which started pouring into Haiti. Haitians used to produce a tremendous amount of rice in the largest river basin, the Artibonite River Basin, and I'll show you some pictures of that coming up. When the largely American imports of rice started flooding the Haitian markets, it in a very short period of time, systematically put almost all Haitian rice farming out of business. Haitians today will tell you that they prefer national rice. They know that it, it tastes better and it's more nutritious, but you can hardly find it on the market because those farmers cannot, still cannot afford to compete with foreign rice imports. 
which started in response to a major national disaster, an earthquake that devastated the entire, entire country. We are also, according to IP, latest IPCC reports, um, seeing decreases in cereal yields um, across the Caribbean, Haiti included. In Haiti, the World Food Program expects to see a 20% increase in the risk of hunger and malnutrition by 2050. Right now, today, um, the Caribbean is in a serious drought. And I uh, can't advance my slides. Click on the not. There we go. There are also changes um, in the ocean. As an island country, Haiti's characteristic of uh, all of the small islands, or all the islands and coastal countries um, in the Caribbean region, the impacts of acidification, which are slow but have an impact on fisheries, the warming of the oceans is already having a tremendous impact on fisheries. Fishermen will tell you they can't find the fish, they think they're going into colder waters, they have to fish further, they have to fish longer. There's a new emerging phenomenon of ocean heat waves. There's also sea level rise, which is driving coastal erosion, flooding, saline intrusion. The coastal ecosystems, which are a combination of mangroves, seagrass beds, coral reefs, are all connected. Where are we going to go with this? What does the new generation have to look forward to? Well, Haitian youth are, I would like to say, charting a future that they are beginning to choose together. And we've been helping to contribute to some methods that um, bring together not just education, but tap into the aspirational, we could say, spiritual, psychological, um, motivational dimension um, that human beings need to bring forward to tackle our climate crisis. We've introduced a program in Haiti, um, the global launch of something called Why Adapt, Youth Adapt. Uh, it was originally developed with Plan International um, for their um, South Asia child-centered climate change education program for eight countries. And we brought the, the curriculum that had been developed um, to Haiti and did the global launch um, with this group of Haitian youth in Cap Haitien in the north. It's a program that not just informs youth about climate change, it's aimed at complementing what they're gonna be learning in school. It's targeting ages 13 to 17, but in reality, um, many youth, because they are late starters in school, because of um, their economic situation generally, um, may be uh, up into their 20s. So this is predominantly a youth engagement program. It's 100% game-based, interactive. Uh, it's aiming at enabling youth to understand climate risks and to use a, a systems lens. We have activities that are game-like that uh, engage youth in, look, in analyzing their own local situation, recognizing what we would call social systems, looking at social cohesion, looking at economics, um, looking at governance, looking at ecological systems, looking at agriculture, looking at uh, forest land or lack thereof, looking at uh, river basins and catchment systems, and then also looking at psychological systems, looking at perceptions, looking at feelings of insecurity, looking at uh, what, are, what is motivating, what are the dreams? Bringing together all of these systems has uh, enabled youth to imagine solutions. It's a collaborative process. Um, here you can see some deep discussion taking place. The youth identify their own problems. They pitch to each other, generally using skits, um, solutions projects, programs that they would like to carry out themselves. They choose, they vote as a group based on a set of criteria, what's feasible, what's important, and then they choose that program to 
uh, implement. The background that we give them is what we're, we're calling integrated risk management. It's looking at the relationship between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation and how we can put solutions in place through restorative landscape management, through ecosystem-based management. So this, these are some pictures of a mapathon that was a collaboration facilitated by the Netherlands Red Cross with Haiti Red Cross. Um, the fellow with the paper who everybody's looking at on your left, uh, Fred Joseph, is a young Haitian GIS specialist who's leading a youth workshop, um, enabling youth to understand um, how to apply GIS, open street map, um, even Facebook to find population data, to do risk analysis and risk assessment um, in the Artibonite River Basin, the largest river basin um, in Haiti that I mentioned with you. The community-driven solutions that they are discussing start with understanding the risk and being able to take this bird's eye or satellite view to see where the roots of the problem lie in order to understand the impacts in the communities down in the uh, red zone. Uh, this is a picture that I took um, in February um, at the outlet of this great agricultural basin. You can see the river coming down to the sea, the Artibonite River. Um, what I'd like you to notice here in the center is the color of the river. This is Haiti's topsoil on its way to the sea. Further up in the river, you can see the exploitation of the basin um, for agriculture, but you can also see the volume of sediment um, ever present in that river due to the uh, deforest, uh, deforested condition upstream. This sediment is on its way to the sea where it triggers a whole other set of environmental problems. So understanding the drivers um, of increased sedimentation is not just a question of the state of the ecosystem, it's also understanding the climate. So here we have um, the Pericles Jean-Baptiste on the left, who is uh, the head of humanitarian diplomacy partnership building for Haiti Red Cross with Esterlin Marcelin, who is the director of Haiti's Unified Hydrometeorological Service. They are in a dialogue uh, with the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, the Disaster Management Agency, about how to use better forecasting to put in place early warning, early action systems that can have multiple benefits to disaster risk reduction and being able to anticipate flooding, to bring back agricultural potential by enabling farmers to be able to anticipate both drought and flood. And there's another dimension that we'll get into. But the idea of integrated risk management is at the core of all of these approaches and the engagement of every partner is to identify what is the role that they bring to a partnership. Understanding what the weather will be is not useful in planning action. We need to know what the weather will do and the humanitarian sector is assisting the National Hydromet Service in channeling investment into impact-based forecasting, which is necessary to be able to manage at the landscape scale. This conversation also includes the hydroelectric dam. The hydro dam has already lost 40% capacity. It's actually close to, closer to 50% capacity of its reservoir 
due to all of that sedimentation that you've seen. The dam is also um, at increased risk because of rainfall intensification due to climate change. The rainfall intensification increases the sediment risk, which is the end of a dam. The sustainability of electric production in Haiti is critically linked to the sediment that comes into that reservoir. This is Haiti's only source of electricity other than generators. And Haiti currently today in the capital has about four to five hours of reliable electricity a day. The majority of the Haitian population is not served with electricity as yet. In order to harness hydropower for electricity, the National Electric Authority has to put in place a sedimentation plan. You may wonder, why didn't they? Well, of course they did in the 1980s when this dam was constructed. The dam was uh, seriously damaged during the earthquake. It's only fully come back on stream a few months ago. The repairs took that long since 2010, the earthquake. But the Electric Authority um, today, and this started in February, has opened a new uh, working group involving the Ministry of Environment to take a fresh look at how can the sediment plan be implemented so that not only can we restore productive flows in the basin, which are necessary to be able to generate hydropower. I could show you pictures from last July where the reservoir looked like a puddle. Um, low flow is, is also as critical as high flow. This is one of the most difficult problems that climate change brings to small developing countries that need to harness hydropower. How can you build to accommodate the variability that comes with rainfall intensification, where you're going to have high flows that probably exceed whatever has been experienced in the past as maximum river flows, you're gonna have more rainfall per hour events, more intensive rainfall events, more flash flooding events than we have ever seen in the past. And at the same time, the intensification of summer drought. So Haiti can be experiencing one of the worst droughts um, that it has ever experienced in 2015, um, over 60% of the population was food insecure because of drought, reduction in um, agricultural production, and at the same time can be experiencing flash flooding with meters of water um, inundating cities and towns downstream of this dam, forced to make releases so that the dam won't break. So this is just some of the complexity that the humanitarian sector is required to engage in, is required to assert the needs of the most vulnerable in the context of national development. So these are some members of um, the Haiti Red Cross on their first visit to the Hydra Dam. I'm going to um, conclude, this is a picture from February, uh, a landmark um, meeting because, um, the, uh, because of the situation in the country, um, uh, the political insecurity, uh, it's not uh, easy or possible to hold meetings in the government ministries. So we met on the outskirts of the capital um, in one of these beautiful uh, open air hotel restaurants. Um, with me uh, to, my, to your left is the director of operations from the hydropower dam. Above him is the director general of the Ministry of Environment. Um, next to him is the chief engineer from the National Electric Authority. Um, next to him, this woman is a government minister. And um, to her right, in your view, 
is the director of the National Electric Authority, and on the far right is the president of Haiti Red Cross. Um, not, president, not present or visible in this picture are representatives of the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Education and the National Disaster Management Authority um, and the World Food Program, all of whom um, during this meeting established a working group um, which is committed to uh, forging what we are calling a green pearl vision uh, for community driven basin scale restorative ecosystem management uh, to bring back the productivity of ecosystem services at the landscape scale uh, working river basin by river basin, starting in the largest artibonite basin and its micro basins. Um, the mapathon that I showed you from last October was the beginning of community risk mapping within that river basin. The goals are to enable agriculture to come back um, and to stimulate the rural economy through agro agricultural processes. We have um, projects which are driven by Red Cross to engage entire communities in reforestation, which is productive. The Ministry of Environment um, has launched new uh, forestry um, nurseries that uh, develop fruit trees and forest trees. Um, there are all kinds of NGOs and community-based organizations that are starting to embrace this idea of um, integrated risk management um, through um, ecosystem restoration. Um, the benefits of flood management and also disaster risk reduction are extremely important to the National Disaster Management Agency. Um, 3,000 people were killed um, in a flood in the Artibonite Basin um, during Hurricane Jean in, I think, 2005. Um, anyone who lived through that will never forget um, not just the loss of human life, but for months um, there uh, were dead cattle and livestock uh, throughout the basin that people had to contend with burying them, clearing, and also trying to regenerate um, livestock on small farms. Um, electricity production, the sustainability of the dam, as I've explained. And then there's this larger vision of Haiti returning, um, not just to a pristine history which never existed, but going forward to become a green pearl in the Caribbean composed of strings of community pearls, catchment basin by catchment basin, that will be the foundation for this vision of climate resilient uh, development. So that's my story. And I've left out many parts. Um, I invite you to challenge me and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanne. That was a wonderful, a wonderful new view of, of Haiti and Haiti's promise, which can represent what we can do everywhere. And so there's about um, 10 minutes for questions. So people can uh, put their questions in the chat box or- um, Or jump in. Or just jump in, <laughs> unmute yourself and jump in. I have a question. Um, this is Mary Beth Lorbecki. And I was just wondering um, two things actually. One is, were beavers ever native to ha Haiti? And would what that- question. <laughs> And would that ever help with your wetland development and topsoil holdings and everything else? Yeah, uh, you know, I have not, uh, castor would be the word in French. I have never heard anyone even mention a beaver. 
I've never seen any evidence of fevers, but what there are are a lot of um, muskrats. <laughs> well, and um, I've been in contact with Ben Goldfarb, the big beaver guy, and I just sent him a note saying, hey, can you tell me if Haiti ever had any, any beavers so I could suggest that? The second yeah. question I had is I'm working in um, Appalachia, which has um, all these impoundments and um, devastated mountainsides because of mountaintop removal and timbering. And I, I was, I'm so loving your model um, and of that integrated youth engagement and different role models and um, just everything about it. And I was just wondering if this model has been applied in other areas, um, this integrated management and also that engagement of the youth for their own areas. Because um, when I listen to the devastation of Haiti and I look at Appalachia, the southern areas devastated by coal, it's so similar and yet so different. So I just thought I'd ask that. Great. Well, you've asked a little um, cluster of questions. So ask for muting for uh, let's see, it might be a good idea if some of you could mute, uh, getting a lot of echo. Are you muted? Okay. That's since Pablo came on, I think. Okay, Pablo, can you mute? He's muted. <laughs> okay, great. So in a way, um, what we're trying to do through something called Partners for Resilience. This is a, a Dutch foreign ministry funded program in 10 countries around the world that is an intentional marriage of humanitarian and environmental organizations. So my work in Haiti is actually funded through this Partners for Resilience program. And the partners normally are um, Dutch humanitarian, Dutch-based humanitarian organizations. So the Netherlands Red Cross, uh, because the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center is, it's a global refer scientific reference center, but it's housed by Dutch Red Cross in The Hague. So legally we are a Dutch organization. So we're one of the core partners, along with uh, Dutch Cord Aid, Dutch Care, other humanitarian organizations, and Wetlands International. However, when um, Haiti was um, selected or we advocated successfully for Haiti to come into the Partners for Resilience Global Program, wetlands is not active in Haiti. So we reached out immediately to the Ministry of Environment because we needed to make that marriage uh, to bring the environmental expertise together with the power uh, of human mobilization, training, the push capacity, and also the incredible network. So in Haiti today, there are about 15,000 active volunteers. So this is, this is the, the workforce that, um, that Haiti can mobilize today. It's uh, for education, aware, public awareness on managing the pandemic. Um, and astonishingly, Haiti is doing a very, very good job of managing the pandemic, despite just incredible uh, constraints. But the, the, the story is in this social cohesion that comes through networks of volunteers. The word volunteer should tell you something. People are not paid to do this. They're doing it because they're motivated. I can't tell you how excited um, the teams of local Red Cross committees that we have taken on successive visits to that hydro dam were when they came out of the dam. They couldn't believe that this level of technology and professional management was possible in their country because it's not what they see day to day. They don't have access to hydropower, but they were so inspired by what is possible, that they're willing to sacrifice their time, um, their energy, and to try to work together for, because they, it helps them to see a vision of what is possible. So part of what's possible is becoming human beavers. And mm -hmm. in many of the Caribbean countries, uh, the geography uh, typically has these very steep ravines. So with the rainfall intensification due to climate change, 
Flash flooding is probably one of the um, most important risks across the entire Caribbean region. Haiti and the Dominican Republic, thanks to NOAA, uh, Haiti is the only country with Dominican Republic that has an operational, sophisticated flash flood guidance system in place. The Red Cross is, and the um, National Disaster Management Agency are working with that um, Hydromet director who I showed you to try to develop the first national and local action plans using information coming out of that flash flood guidance system. The vision is first, we just wanna save lives. So we wanna look at the flash flood. But the vision is we wanna bring back the rural economy. We wanna create new jobs. We want the power of information, of understanding the impact of uh, climate on the environment to enable people to uh, sustainably manage the, a productive, um, regenerative um, landscape, and to uh, and, and to and to and to create a mosaic of new livelihoods, community by community. So that's kind of the, the vision behind all this. Um, the human beaver is not just a vision. Um, in a number of communities in the South, um, bringing in um, Dutch engineers to, to look at the siting um, and to give advice on construction techniques that could be carried out by volunteers within communities, they designed check dams. And these check dams um, are using local stone. I mean, it's literally hand-to-hand -hand brigades women, children, men, all together. Um, I, I should have shown you some pictures. The only ones I have are pretty grainy. They're not great. But they passed rocks up these ravines, um, constructed uh, groins and dams, you know, just doing uh, wire cages. But the way that these check dams are designed is to trap sediment. And then they've systematically planted behind the check dams to hold the sediment to retain it. And these check dams, they serve as bridges. So they connect communities on either side of the ravine because they have, uh, now they have a path to cross. They have the sediment building up behind the check dams, which is fertile. And they're planting um, mixed tree species with advice from the Ministry of Agriculture. They're using these new nurseries, the fruit and forest nurseries that the Ministry of Agriculture has opened. Um, to, to retain um, the soil on the slopes. And they're uh, doing more extensive reforestation, kind of using these check dams as the staging, the staging ground. So there's a whole kind of um, short, medium, long-term process underway. Um, and I would, I would say, I mean, I hadn't thought of it before, but I mean, it really is like human beavers. I mean, that's what they're doing. Jeno. Are you familiar with Michael Kravchek's work? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, he started doing this 30 years ago. He's a hydrologist in Slovakia. Oh, and yes, we, I know him very well. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and we have yeah. pictures. The Slovakian check dams are, are wood, but I, I'm guessing that in Haiti that would be more difficult because of the scarcity of wood. Exactly. Um, um, yeah. But it's the, it's the same. There, there's all kinds of techniques and part yeah. of this, and, then, and this was the brilliance of the Dutch engineers, that they looked at it from the lens of what, what could people, what materials could people use in this ravine to construct something, not only that they can construct, but if, you know, it gets washed out, how could they rebuild it? But the proof came because it's not a, it's not a new method. The government right. has tried to build other types of check dams before and they've, and they've failed, they've washed out. Mm. So the brilliance of this was that the communities built it themselves, that they're, they're adding on all kinds of additional benefits, which essentially mean that they're also, they're tending to these check dams. If yeah. some stones get displaced, they replace them. But the proof came after Hurricane Matthew in 2016, when the communities downstream where the check dams had been installed were protected, yep. whereas other ravines, communities experienced um, flooding and washouts and all kinds of you know, loss and damage. 
Um, yeah. I have, oh, I just wanted to ask if you're doing also tree planting for buffer zones along the streams that are, I mean, because when I saw that artistic vision, it didn't look like that. And I thought that's also one of your natural sediment holders. Yeah, exactly. So there's all kinds of things which are kind of um, in process. And that is, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's part of the whole suite of techniques. So planting, you know, wind breaks, um, head, living fences, you know, all these kinds of things are, um, they're, they're programmed essentially as they can be projectized. So, and, and, and we're having parallel developments all over the world, as, as we'll see in, in future talks. Um, Jeanne, I So part I of hate... the process is demonstration activities yes. that establish yeah. the can-do, um, yeah. you know, and that's the big story, that Haiti is not incapable, um, but a lot of it has to do with advocacy to take these approaches to scale. Yeah. So a lot of what we're saying today in Haiti is we don't need new demonstration projects. We need investment programs so that we can jumpstart this at scale. We've yeah. proven what we can do. <laughs> yep, yep. The, the, proof, the proof abounds. And I particularly appreciated what you said about the youth seeing the possibilities and getting inspired and energized. And that sums up what we're trying to do here and what people are doing with ecological restoration camps and just on and on and on.